and first kick off with Ken Blackwell, who has already uh, been briefly introduced, uh, coming up as the mayor of Cincinnati, uh, up to and, and through that and serving uh, in <coughs> government office, going back to the treasurer, and of course, two terms as secretary of state, and my choice for governor of that great state. Ken, thank you. Thanks very much. I <laughs> come from a, a family of um, extremes. I have folks who are long in oratory and others who have mastered the short, quick. My uncle Albert used to say that doomsday is that day that we get all of the government that we pay for. <laughs> And it sort of sums up what the challenge of the American experience has been <clears throat> since we broke with the monarchy in Great Britain. Ladies and gentlemen, since Aristotle's recordings and observations, we have been taken with the conflict between the state and the individual, between individual liberty and the organized power of the state between the reduction of the individual's moral responsibility and the absolute <clears throat> power of the state. The growth of the welfare state has provided us with three wrong ideas, four wrong ideas, and four threats to our first principles. The first is that the government can run the economy better than markets and individual decisions. The second is that government workers and professionals can make better decisions for your family than you. The third is that the work ethic is old and antiquated. This is a cultural phenomenon. We are rapidly becoming a culture where earning money doesn't entitle you to it, but wanting money does. That is a fundamental cultural threat to our first principles. And the fourth is moral relativism. If we go to the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, it starts, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Mount Barber used to say, that's a simple way of saying any knucklehead should be able to get this. <laughs> that all of us are created equal. We're not all equal in size, we're not all equal in weight, we are not all equal in intelligence, we're not all equal in income. We're equal in that we're all accountable to our God, and we are equal in God's investment of human dignity in us. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, which means that our human rights, our basic rights, are not grants from government, but they're gifts from God given to us in a particular order, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is very difficult to enjoy liberty if you did. And in the limited powers of government, one of those powers is to protect innocent life. It is very difficult to enjoy or to pursue happiness if you're not free. That sums up the challenge when coupled with the four wrong-headed notions. I remember, General, I was at a small university in Ohio and I had gone to speak. Before I got on the podium, and to the podium, I had gone to the restroom and scribbled there in the men's room was, God is dead, Nietzsche. I got back there within 18 months that was scratched out and it said, Nietzsche is dead, God. <laughs> that is the struggle of the first principles. Because 
We have a president that wants to transform our market economy into a government-controlled economy. He wants to transform our family-centered society into a government-centered society. Most importantly, he wants to transform our national philosophy founded upon the primacy of the individual and the supremacy of God to one founded upon the primacy of the collective good and the supremacy of the central government. Mr. Obama's problem is that the Constitution of the United States stands in his way. The framers of the Constitution drew these words and these concepts together, understanding that they were erecting a wall designed to stop any president from fundamentally transforming our country. As we talk about first principles, I want to just sum up my opening remarks by saying I had a great uncle who was the first African American to win an Olympic gold medal. He did it in the 1924 games in Paris. He had qualified to run the 100 against Eric Little, the high hurdles, and the long jump. When he got to Paris, he was told that he couldn't run the 100 yard dash or the high hurdles because they were for white only events. He, in fact, didn't run because of their ignorance. <clears throat> Little didn't run because the finals fell on the Sabbath and he chose fidelity to faith. When my uncle came back to Cincinnati, he told my mom's generation that God had put him in a place where he would know just how important, much more important than the gold medal, fidelity to faith is. Ladies and gentlemen, the moral foundation that champions the responsibility of the individual, the promise of God, and leads us to put a choke, a harness on the growth and expansion and intrusion of government in our lives is what the first principles are all about. The issue is whether we will take a stand and fight from the Atlantic to the Pacific or whether we will tuck our tails and run and blow out the candles of hope.